All right, so one of Jesus' most famous sayings is also one of his most important sayings, but it's also one of his scariest sayings. I mean, of all the things that Jesus taught, when he told his followers that if they wanted to be his disciple, they would have to pick up their cross to follow him, that's a scary sentence. And when Jesus said, uh, if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake and for the sake of the kingdom, you will find it. That's a scary thing. Like, we've talked about this before, how, you know, before the cross was a symbol of Christianity, the cross was just a symbol of Rome killing people. For Jesus to say, to follow me, to be my disciple, you have to do so while picking up your cross— it's not at all unlike, you know, saying, you know, in today's language, if you're going to follow me, you do so with a gun in your mouth. Or if you follow me, if you're going to be my disciple, you, you have to have a noose around your neck. What Jesus was saying was, was, you need to be willing to die. And a lot of times when we teach this idea, a lot of times when we see this within the scriptures, we think, oh, hey, Jesus is, he's giving a parable, or he's being metaphorical, or he's, uh, he's teaching an allegory. Because, you know, that's what Jesus does <clears throat> a lot. Over and over and over we see in the scriptures Jesus teaching an allegory and parable and metaphor and stories. And so we think, okay, well, Jesus didn't really mean if you're going to follow him, you're going to die. But I think in this case, for a, a lot of people, especially during the first century, that's exactly what it meant. Jesus was speaking literally. I mean, remember, Jesus had enemies in this world. He had very powerful enemies, very powerful religious and political enemies. And they killed him because of what he taught and what he stood for and who he defended and, and all of that. And so the people who followed him had the same enemies. They inherited his enemies. The same people that wanted Jesus dead are the same people that wanted Jesus' disciples dead. The same teaching that Jesus proclaimed and taught and preached, well, that was the same teaching that his followers proclaimed and preached and taught. And so the same people who wanted to kill Jesus and did kill Jesus very often killed his disciples as well. Jesus was crucified, and sometimes his followers were crucified. And, and, and sometimes you know, my fav- one of my favorite stories in the early church of, is of an apostle who uh, d- demands he is crucified upside down so as to not be uh, crucified the way Jesus was. Sometimes they were beheaded. Sometimes they were burned at the stake. Sometimes they were in the Roman arena in the Colosseum. But for Jesus to say, if you're going to be my disciple, you need to take up your cross to follow me, that is not so much a a prescription. It's not so much a, hey, this is what you need to do, as much looking back in history, it's a description. It's just sort of what happened. And so we should understand Jesus' teaching when he said, take up your cross to follow me, is being literal. And yet here's the truth. Like, not everybody dies for their faith you're probably not going to die for your faith. I know I, I grew up listening to sermons who wanted to tell me over and over and over, you need to be ready and willing to die for your faith. And that's great, and that's fine, but you're probably not going to die for your faith. I mean, like, for one, we live in America. I mean, it's a, a religiously neutral, free country. Like, people don't really die for their religion in this country, um, at least on an official level. It's okay, like, you know, that's, that, that's the way that, that is. You're probably not going to die that. But also, like, let's just be honest. As you look through church history, a lot of people died for their faith, but not everybody. A lot of people just became Christians and lived a nice, quiet life and died of old age in their bed, and that's that. I mean, most people did not die for their faith. And so the Apostle Paul decided, as he was writing part of the New Testament, that he was going to go ahead and do what Jesus maybe did not. Jesus maybe did not allegorize this idea of taking up at one's cross. He did not make it a spiritual reality for everybody. And so the Apostle Paul did. The Apostle Paul made this taking up one's cross into a spiritual allegorical lesson. And he did so in Galatians chapter 2 in a verse that I'll bet you a dollar you've heard a time or a hundred. It's in Galatians chapter 2. It should be behind me. There it is. So glad to have that with me now. Uh, this is what Paul says to the first century church in Galatia. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 
Now, Paul takes this idea of, of Jesus saying, take up your cross and follow me. Paul takes that idea, and he turns it into a spiritual reality. And what's interesting about this is Paul does die for his faith. But well before he died for his faith, Paul considers himself dead already. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. If you grew up in the church, this is one of those super famous verses. I am a child and a product of the 90s. I, uh, I, I, I grew up in a church youth group era where, you know, we, we love to put Bible verses on t-shirts. You know, we love to do that. You could buy one of those t-shirts, you know, at the Christian bookstore that we love to go to. You know, it had all that music that doesn't sing about girls. It just changes it to, to Jesus. And so it's okay, even though it's kind of, kind of terrible. So like the worst version of what's on the radio, but about Jesus instead of a girl. At the Christian bookstore, next to that are the t-shirts. <clears throat> and they all, you know, had Bible verses. And this is one of those verses that was super, super popular. I, I, you, if you went to church camp, this was absolutely one of those memory verses you would memorize. I remember in Bible college, you know, we would be randomly assigned Bible verses. And like no one wanted Song of Solomon. No one wanted that. That was weird, and we didn't want to do it. But Galatians 2.20, oh, man, like this sermon preaches itself. If you're randomly given Galatians 2.20, oh, man, I, I, I mean, I am crucified with Christ. That, that is a sermon that, you know, anybody can preach that sermon. That's so simple because it's the kind of idea that we can all relate to. Paul was very simply saying that as Christians that we, we, we die to who we used to be. That, that part of repentance, part of being a Christian, is saying, I want to do things God's way. And that means the old person you used to be ceases to exist in, in at least a metaphorical way. And so as we repent, we are new creations, we are new people, we've been given a new life. And so saying, I am crucified with Christ, is a very poetic, very powerful way of saying, I'm repenting of sin. And that is super easy to preach on. And I'll bet you a dollar you've heard a million sermons just like that. And I'm not saying they were wrong at all. It's not what I'm saying. They're right. I'm just not always sure that we understand how dramatic this is supposed to be. And I think if we look at what Paul was saying specifically, because you see, Paul wasn't preaching a sermon. Paul was writing to a group of people in a time and a place for a reason. I think we can see just how dramatic this really is. Here's what we read. If we just rewind the section just a little bit, back to Galatians chapter 2, starting at verse 15, here's the background of Paul saying, I have been crucified with Christ. He says this to the people at Galatia. He says, you and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ. Not by obeying the law. We have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ. Not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. You see, we talk about repentance. And we think about repentance as being like, oh, I, you know, I don't want to cheat and lie and steal and, and all that. And, and great, beautiful, awesome. But you see, Paul said he was repenting from the law. And that sounds weird because the law, in his context, is the law of Moses. Which, as you might be aware, is in the Bible. Which means Paul was saying, I am repenting of following part of the Bible. That's a, that's a weird sentence. Paul was saying, I am repenting from this idea that I am made right with God by doing what Moses taught us to do. Even if God's the one that spoke to Moses, I am now repenting of doing those things. Paul specifically says, I no longer try to do what the law says. I, I have stopped trying to fulfill its requirements. I have died to it so that I can live with Christ. That's crazy if you think about it. I mean, he is turning his back on the law of Moses, the thing that Jews lived by for centuries. 
Now, we talked about the last couple of weeks. We talked about how Galatians is written to a specific situation in the first century world, okay? Uh, it's this, this, this conflict between cultural Jews and cultural non-Jews being Gentiles. That people who are Jewish, they were the ones who kind of had the church first, and then the Gentiles are brought in. And there's a lot of question about who gets to decide how things go in this church. Is it going to be a Jewish church? Is it going to be a Gentile church? Do the people who are Gentiles have to convert to Judaism? Do they have to follow the law? Do they have to be circumcised? Do they have to eat kosher? Do they have to do all these different things? And there's a big debate because, you know, Jesus never said anything about this. Jesus never really, you know, he said things in broad terms that we can, we can understand, but Jesus never directly said, hey, this is what you do in this situation. So there was kind of a debate in the church between apostles and teachers and prophets and, and priests, and they were all saying, hey, what do we do? And in the end, Paul was a guy who would be torn. You see, Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. Which means Paul was firmly in that Gentile camp of, hey, uh, I'm going to welcome everybody into the church. Whether or not they're Jewish, whether or not they eat kosher, whether or not they're circumcised. Paul's mission in life was to preach to people who were not Jewish. And yet, for Paul, the conflict within himself came from the fact that nobody was more Jewish than Paul. Paul called himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee, one of of those guys that had opposed Jesus. He was a Pharisee, and he absolutely loved the law of Moses. He had lived his life for the law of Moses. He had taught it. He had read it. He had preached it. He had lived it. And so personally, Paul would never dare to break the law of Moses. Even if he was teaching other people, it's fine if you do. Paul never would. And so that's the conflict going on within Paul's heart here. And at the end of the day, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. I have died to the law because Paul understood that the law could not save him. He says, I have not been made right with God by obeying the law. Nobody has been made right with God by obeying the law or any law. What Paul was saying, if we can make this a little bit bigger, is Paul was saying that there is never a rule we can follow that will make God love us. There is never a a code of ethics that we can adhere to that will make God accept us. There is no, there are no hoops to jump through to make God say, okay, great, perfect, now you're mine. That's not the way it works. Law and rules and regulations and institutions, none of them bring us to God. That's why Jesus showed up. And so Paul said, I have to crucify myself because Paul, as a Jew, was saying, I will trust the law if you let me. If I don't kill the part of myself, if I don't consider that part dead, I will always trust the law. I will always assume that the more good things I do, the more rules I follow, the more God loves me. And so Paul said, I have been crucified to the law. I have died to this understanding of God in which he only loves me when I do certain things. And that's extremely important for us to hear. Because there is nobody in this room, I don't think, that is worried about following the law of Moses. If nothing else, y'all like bacon too much. And y'all like doing stuff on Saturdays that's fun. Like, you can't do any of that if you follow the law of Moses. I get it, okay. It's because you're not Jewish. But you see, when we make it a little bit bigger, the truth of the matter is this. For as many times as we sing Amazing Grace, as often as we want to talk about salvation is by Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone, all of that, The truth is this, there is a part of each one of us, there's part of us that truly believes that good people follow rules and bad people don't. And the only reason that we have any reason to follow the law or or to fear the law is if we're breaking the law. There's a part of us that believes the only way we should distrust the law is if we're not obeying it. That people who don't break the law, well... They have nothing to fear at all. We believe and trust in law and order. We think that the solution to people sinning is to make more laws and make more rules and just tell them no. And if somebody messed up, well, sorry about your luck, you should have said no. 
there's a part of us that trusts in the law and order and institutions and rules and regulations. Even if it's not the law of Moses, it might be the law of our land. But boy, do we trust it. And if Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, I died to the law so that I could live with Christ, then I think we need to say the same thing. So I need to tell you an unpleasant story to disabuse ourselves of the notion that law is good. Cool? Cool. The year was 1836. St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis, Missouri at the time was uh, really a divided place. It was a place that was divided because the country itself in America in 1836 was incredibly, incredibly divided. We were eh, not quite 20 years from a civil war that was fought over slavery. Uh, fought over one group of people believing they could own a, another group of people. And when other people said, hey, stop that, they said, no, you can't tell us we can't own people. And so then they fought about it. So different states in the country had different laws. And Missouri, as it turns out in 1836, was a slave state, which was bad news for anyone who happened to be a free black person. Well, one of those free black people was a man named Francis McIntosh. Francis McIntosh was a free person who, who was from another state that was not Missouri, and he actually worked on a steamboat, which means he traveled all over the country um, on this steamboat, which means sometimes he went in slave states and sometimes he went in states that were not slave states. But he himself was a free man. Well, one night, Francis McIntosh, as he was in, they were in port in St. Louis, uh, Missouri, he decided he was going to go out, and that is when he found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time. The wrong place was St. Louis, Missouri, and the wrong time was, other than 1836, was the time that two police officers were trying to apprehend an actual criminal. They were chasing a criminal through the streets, the criminal got away, and the police officers, very frustrated, said, we need to look for somebody else to blame. And instead of blaming themselves for not catching the guy, they blamed Francis McIntosh, who happened to be standing there. And they said, hey, why didn't you catch the guy for us? And the guy probably responded with, I'm not a cop. But they charged him, they arrest him, and they charged him with breaching the peace for the crime of not catching the criminal who ran by him. Which you'll notice is a lot like if I got real mad at all of you for not coming to church and preaching an awesome sermon. Like if I was like, hey, you didn't preach a sermon today, so now I'm mad. That's my job. Maybe I do my job and... Don't blame other people for not doing theirs. Anyway, the point is he gets arrested for not catching the criminal. And he thinks this is crazy. What's going on? You know, I'm like, this is not the way people should be treated as citizens. And they told him, you're going to spend the next five years in prison for breaching the peace. Which you'll notice is nonsense. But is simply what the sort of thing that happened in 1836 in St. Louis, Missouri, if you were a free black man. So what happened next is a matter of historical dispute. We know that Francis McIntosh escaped. We know that he ran away. We know that suddenly the cops were very good at catching criminals and caught up to him. We know there was a scuffle. And we know that one of the police officers ended up dying because he got stabbed. That's about all we know. We might know more if there had been a trial the way that you're supposed to be. It's the way that things are supposed to happen in this country. If there had been a trial for Francis McIntosh, we might actually know the truth. But instead of there being a trial, Francis McIntosh was apprehended by an angry mob, uh, tied to a pole, and lit on fire publicly as a uh, message to black people for existing. I told you it was a lovely story. So, in the next coming weeks after, there was a minister. His name was Elijah Lovejoy. Elijah Lovejoy was a, was a minister who, he had these crazy ideas about the Bible, that, that the Bible taught us that God made all people, and therefore, all people should be treated like people. And Elijah Lovejoy had this idea that, that you can't love your neighbor while also owning them as property. So Elijah Lovejoy was an abolitionist. He wanted slavery done away with. And he thought that the best way he could get rid of this, this terrible evil was by educating everybody about what the scriptures taught about the equality of all people. And so Elijah Lovejoy bought a printing press and became a newspaper person. 
And he would regularly put sermons and teachings and, and ideas from the scriptures uh, to try to teach people, hey, listen, stop doing this to your brother uh, or your sister because we we're all brothers and sisters and God made all of us and we're all equal. Stop being terrible. And being that Missouri was a slave state, he thought, well, those people need to hear it. And so he moved to St. Louis. And so when Francis McIntosh was lynched and murdered, Francis, uh, he decided to, to write about Francis McIntosh quite uh, regularly and quite extensively. We know this because at the trial, the judge who was there to supposedly try for the crimes of murder, the entire angry mob, instead said that the, the fault of racism in St. Louis was not the people who had killed the black person, but instead it was Elijah Lovejoy's fault. Because, you see, he'd been writing against slavery and stirring the people up, you see. And it was his fault. He was the reason for racism. If he hadn't been there, nobody would be racist at all. He was writing about the racism and inciting riots. You'll notice that is called nonsense. But it's what the judge said. And so Elijah Lovejoy was called out by this judge who did not convict any of the other people of a crime. And sure enough, I have this firm belief that human beings will do exactly what they can get away with. And so, soon after, Elijah Lovejoy found himself the target of angry white mobs of people who wanted him to stop. They destroyed his printing presses three times. And all three times, he just built or bought a new one (laughs) and kept printing his material. And so one day they decided, well, we'll just have to kill him too. And Elijah Lovejoy was murdered right across the river in Illinois. Again, terrible stories. So why am I telling you these stories? Because here's the truth of the matter. When we look at these stories, we see that the law failed these people. The law failed Francis McIntosh. The law failed Elijah Lovejoy. And the law failed them in different ways, okay? In the case of Francis McIntosh, the police were absolutely, positively corrupt. And the judge was absolutely positively corrupt. The law was actively hostile towards Francis McIntosh. And it failed him, and he died for it. Elijah Lovejoy, well, he was failed in a different way. His rights to preach and teach and speak and do what he wanted to say and, and put out materials and print all of his sermons, that was protected by the First Amendment. That was protected speech, and yet he was passively failed by the law because nobody seemed to care about defending his rights at all, and he ended up murdered for it. In both cases, these men were let down by the laws of this land. And I could talk about, you know, countless people. I chose 1836 because it seemed sufficiently far enough for no one to get offended. But the truth of the matter is this. These stories teach us, if nothing else, that if we trust in law and order and institutions, we're trusting in something that is inherently untrustworthy. Understand, the scriptures all over teach us that the best thing that the law does is show us that we can't follow the law. The, all a law or institution is truly good for is showing us our weaknesses. It's fantastic at teaching us that we need salvation from ourselves and other people, but that uh, the problem is ourselves and other people, and so the law isn't really going to do that. We shouldn't trust in law or order because law and order will fail us. Paul understood that. And so as much as he loved the law, as much as he wanted to be a person who followed the law of Moses, he simply couldn't do it. And so he said, I have been crucified to the law and I trust in Christ. Now, what in the world does this have to do with Christmas? This is the Christmas series. These stories are not the sorts of things you want to tell your kids on Christmas morning with a cup of hot chocolate and eggnog, and unless the eggnog's got something in it to, to help you get through it. What, are these, what does this have to do with Christmas? Well, here's what it has to do with Christmas, okay? You see, we think of the Christmas stories in the Bible as being stories about the birth of Jesus, and that's kind of true. Christmas stories are almost universally stories about how people responded to the birth of Jesus. Now, some of those responses were really, really great. We're going to talk in the next few weeks about about Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the wise men. Their response to the birth of Jesus was wonderful and great. 
Some of them were not so good. We're going to have a sermon that's also fairly unpleasant. We talk about Herod and his soldiers, their response to Christ. But the stories of the scriptures are largely about the response to the birth of Christ. And there's two people that we don't often think about. Part of the Christmas story who met the infant Jesus, whose response tells us everything about where our allegiance and our trust should be. Their names are Simeon and Anna. Simeon was a priest who taught in the temple. And he said that he had been shown a vision by God that he would see the Messiah born before he died. And so as a very old man in the temple, he was simply waiting to see the Messiah before he could move on to the next way that we exist. And Anna was a, was a, was a widowed prophet and she spent all of her days praying and fasting in the temple and talking about the way that God was going to rescue the people uh, of, of the world. And here's what we read in the gospel according to Luke, what happened When Simeon and Anna met Jesus, we read this. Simeon took the child, being Jesus, in his arms, and he praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace, as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Anna came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Israel. Understand what's happening here. Simeon is a priest. Anna is a prophet. They are connected to the temple. They teach the law. They follow the law. They, they, they trust in and they hope in the law. At least you would think that they might. If anyone should trust in the law, it would be Simeon. And Anna, they're the ones who teach it, after all. And yet Simeon says, my life is not complete until I meet Jesus. I cannot die in peace until I meet Jesus. For Simeon, the law was not enough for peace. He needed Jesus. Anna is talking to people who are waiting for the salvation of the world. And so as Simeon says, hey, uh, Jesus is the light of God that shows God to all nations. Anna goes and tells people, who are waiting for God's rescue about a child. Anna did not say, follow these rules, even though you think that she might. Simeon and Anna are great candidates for people who would have trusted in law. If law was trustworthy, they would be the ones to do it. And yet by their own words, they did not trust in anything other than the birth of Christ. For you and I, it is always going to be a temptation to be like Paul and say, okay, I trust in law and order. I trust in rules. I trust my salvation. I trust my day in and day out actions. I trust in just me doing the right thing. And if I do the right thing, everything will work out and God will bless me and honor me and all of that. That is always going to be a temptation. And so like Paul saying, I have been crucified with Christ in the most dramatic language possible. He says, I have died to the idea that if I do something right, God will love me. I have stopped trying to follow the law so that I can be in a relationship with Jesus. You and I are called to do the exact same thing. As difficult as it might be, as much as it flies in the face with who we are as people instinctively, we have to crucify that part of ourselves that trusts in institutions and religious ideologies and political parties and governments and laws and order and and all of that and say, I don't trust in anything but Jesus. Not just for my eternal soul when I die one day. But you see, Paul said he died well before He stopped breathing. Paul said, as he lived and breathed every single day, I have been crucified with Christ. It is Christ who lives in me because I trust him and him alone. This morning we're in our third week of our series called Every Season's Reason. And as we talk about the connection between Christmas and this book of Galatians, as we look at Paul's comments about the law and the law of Moses and all of this, as we make these connections, There are lessons to be learned, not just about Christmas, but about every season we find ourselves in. This morning, as we talk about Elijah Lovejoy and Francis McIntosh and Simeon and Anna and Paul and the Galatians and Jesus Christ himself, uh, we learn a lesson. Our third lesson, 
from every season's reason is this. We have been crucified with Christ. That means we trust him, not any rules, institutions, or laws. We have been crucified with Christ. We trust in him, not rules, not institution, and not laws. Okay, so what does this have to do with Christmas and your everyday day in and day actions? Here's the point, okay? We have to understand. Everybody celebrates Christmas, and that's great. Simeon's words are some of the most beautiful words I've ever seen in the scriptures, where Simeon says that Jesus is a light to all people. Salvation has been prepared for all people. That is a beautiful, beautiful idea from Simeon, okay? Everybody should celebrate Christmas because Jesus is for everybody. But look, people who don't understand the gospel celebrate Christmas. They do. Christmas is celebrated by all sorts of people who are either religious or not religious, know Jesus, don't know Jesus, are actively hostile to Jesus, are, are, everybody celebrates Christmas, like everybody does, essentially. And so we have to understand that there's a sharp divide. There's a line in the sand between those people who understand the gospel and have been crucified with Christ and those who maybe don't. And that's not a condemnation of anybody else. Please do not hear it that way. I'm not at all Criticizing anyone else has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with us, okay? We understand who Jesus is. And so it is our responsibility to view the world in such a way that we are looking at Jesus as not just the Savior of the world who was born, but we're looking at Jesus as the perfect revelation of who God is, the perfect representation of what God is doing and has done, and the true word of God that we place our trust in. And every single day, in so many ways, there are voices screaming at us to trust them. And maybe the strongest ones are the ones that are like the law of Moses. That say, hey, do this and you'll be safe. Do this and you'll be fine. Do this and things will work out. And that's why we need to remember things like stories of Elijah Lovejoy and Francis McIntosh. You can do everything right and it will not work out. The law is not on your side. Because all law really does is show us our weakness. All any rule ever does is show us that we are fruitless to keep it. And so that's why salvation is grace. That's why we are are saved by our faith. That is why it is Christ and Christ alone that we hope in, we trust in, and we find peace in. Not just this season, but in all of them. So when the musicians are going to forward, they're going to sing a song. We offer an invitation each and every week to take God up on this offer. To say, I want things God's way. I want to be crucified with Christ. It is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The Bible teaches that we repent and are baptized. Repent is to do exactly that. To be baptized is a symbolic act that represents that. We go down in the water, our old selves are symbolically put to death. We get out of the water, our new selves are symbolically born again. God promises that we are forgiven of sin, we are given his spirit, we are made brand new. You never made that decision? Nice warm baptistry, all sorts of people can do it. Let's talk. If you're already a merciful believer in Christ, looking for a perfect church home, this place is not it. We do serve a perfect God. We want to connect, we want to call, we want to cultivate. We want to trust in Jesus and Jesus alone, above and beyond anything or anyone else, including the very things that make us feel safe when we follow rules. As we stand and as we sing.